If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do not know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Who can say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in, in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may also ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And thank you, Ed, for doing that incredibly long reading. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Now, that's all the time we have for today, folks. So really, you know, we can probably just move on ahead. Now, that is a very difficult reading. And it is a lengthy reading, but it's a reading that carries a very important message. And that very important message, and I did not tell you this at the beginning, the very important message is in the first two lines. So we probably could have stopped there. <laughs> so I was just so enthralled by your voice that I just wanted to keep going and go, no, it was awesome. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. And sometimes we read right past that because we often do that at memorial services. Yeah. We do that at funerals. That's the classic funeral reading and everybody gets to the part about in my father's mansions there are many rooms. Would it not be so when I say I've gone to prepare a room for you? But the question is, Jesus says so many times, do not be discouraged. Do not despair. For I will not leave you as orphans. But that is not a word to tell us that we can just sit back and relax and think all things are well and good. Because Jesus says that because we have a sacred task and we have a sacred mission. Now in the reading that Paul said, it's his second letter to the church in Corinth. And he talks about what it's probably like to be a Christian. And he says, you know, we've been persecuted. We've been put down. We've been punished. We've been imprisoned. He goes through this entire list. And all of a sudden you're thinking, you know, this is not the best marketing campaign for the church. But the truth is, he's talking about a very important reality. He is talking about the reality that we are called to persevere in love in this world. Think about it. That's not simply a platitude or a preachment or something we hear on Sunday morning. That's the reality. We are called to persevere against all odds in this world. And what are those odds? The very most important and most significant odd we're called to persevere against is this idea that hate can fuel action. That hate can fuel dysfunction. That hate can fuel racism. That hate can fuel marginalization. That hate can fuel persecution. And we're called to persevere under that. But oh, it's easy to give in. It is so easy to give in to those forces. And say, you know what, we can't do anything. I'm one person. I'm one person, I can't do a thing to, to families that are suffering. I'm one person, I can't do a thing to a child who is caught up in dysfunction. I can't do a thing to someone who is caught up in involuntary poverty. I can't do a thing about that. So I'm just going to say it is what it is. And I'm going to look somewhere in the Bible and I'm going to find a verse that's going to support me in that. But actually what we want to think about today is what it truly means to persevere. What it truly means to persevere in a world that right now is very easy to give up. Think about that. 
it's very, very easy to give up. You know, in my, my prior life, I worked a lot in higher education. And do you know the retention rates in higher education are at the lowest they have ever been in this nation? People aren't finishing college. People aren't finishing what they start. People are not living out the life of being a Christian because it is hard, it is difficult. People are losing the ability to persevere. And this is why we're losing the ability to persevere. We're misunderstanding the word totally. The word persevere does not mean put up with the current situation. It does not mean it's okay that people are marginalized. It does not mean that people are, it's okay that people are hungry. It does not mean that people are in involuntary poverty. It's okay. It does not mean that it's all right to just leave people in prison and reject them and marginalize them until they get out and then they have nowhere to go and no way to earn a living. That's not, it's not right to say that's okay. But that's how some people talk about persevere. To just say, I'm going to walk through this struggle. And if I'm a Christian, my reward's on the other side of this life. But that's not what Jesus called us to do. Jesus didn't call us to do that for one moment. Jesus called us to persevere. And so what does that word really mean? Persevere really means, and I said this earlier, persevere means to create the good not built on circumstance. That's what persevere means. Persevere means that when you are in a situation of suffering, you can create the good by knowing you're not suffering alone. You're not suffering without God's strength. Persevere means to create the good amid the struggle of life. And we have no finer example than when Jesus walked among us. If you look at the work of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus, that was perseverance, creating the good amid the struggles of life, creating the good in one life at a time. You notice, and this is often brought up, people who question our faith said, why didn't Jesus just miraculously heal everybody who was suffering? Why didn't Jesus just clear, every, cleanse every leper? Why didn't Jesus just turn every page of a sinner's life? Why didn't Jesus just set all the captives free? Jesus did it one life at a time and persevered. We are called to do the same. We are called to create the good amid the struggle of life. We are called to create the good amid the struggle of life and then share that good. That's what perseverance is all about. Perseverance is not simply standing strong, having a stiff upper lip, walking through everything and saying, you know, it doesn't faze me, it doesn't bother me, that's just the way it is. Perseverance is saying, that's not the way it has to be. And I can tell you that if you persevere in one life, if you persevere in one life of struggle, you fulfill God's mission in your life. If you persevere in one family, you fulfill God's mission. I know one of, the, one of my areas of ministry has been, uh, for many, many times, working with people who have found themselves on the wrong side of the law okay. in one form or fashion. And the bottom line is when you do that, you can literally create good in a life if that person is open to knowing the good. You can create good in a life if that person is to allowing that good to be created. You can create good in a life if that person recognizes that your task is to not tell them what good looks like. Your task is to create good that they can embrace. Your task is to embrace a good, create a good that they can embrace, and a good that will affect them. And that was a tough lesson for me to learn. 
because some of, the, some of my areas of ministry have been difficult. I've worked in homeless ministry, I've worked in juvenile justice ministry, I've worked in ex-offender ministry, and some of those along the way have been very difficult ministries and very hard for me to create good with some of the stuff you encounter, with some of the stories you hear. Very hard for me to create good. But now I know I don't have the option. If I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, I have no choice. I have to create the good. And so my challenge to all of you this week as we're talking about perseverance, and you know, each week I talk about another pillar of how Salem made 180 years. Last week it was hope. This week it's perseverance. <laughs> but don't think about perseverance just as well. We've been here 180 years through tornadoes, through fires, through depression, through wars, through pandemics, through epidemics. Don't think about it that way. Think about how this church over the years has created good. I love to hear the stories of what has happened in this church because the church created good in lives. I love to hear the story of how this church has reached out to people when they were suffering. I love to hear the stories of how people would go out of their way to make sure no one was hungry, to make sure no one was suffering alone. That's how Salem has survived because Salem has always created the good. And so this week, I'm asking you, Think about someone you know who's going through a tough time and needs someone to help them create the good. Think about someone you know who is struggling and maybe challenged to persevere and think about how you can enter into their life and help them know good can be created. Good can rise. Good can prevail. That is what it means to persevere. It does not mean to give up. It does not mean to accept all things as that's the way it is. It means to say, no matter the struggle, I can persevere. No matter the hardship, I can persevere. You know, I think Natalie was quoting from 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love narrative, and I love the way it ends. The three important things Trust steadily in God. These are the three things to perseverance. One, trust steadily in God, and you'll create the good. Two, hope unswervingly, and you'll create the good. And three, love extravagantly, and the greatest of these is love. And as you love extravagantly, folks, you create a good that death that evil cannot dim or diminish. Amen. 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 Please join me in the uh, closing prayer found in your bulletin. Almighty God, today, today we have been awakened, awakened to the call to persevere through all hardships and tribulations, secure and resting in your faithfulness. We have heard the call to meet all hardship with joy and to love amid each struggle of life's journey. Send us forth to carry that message of perseverance to all who suffer, all who fear, and all who live in the shadow of despair. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join us in our closing hymn, Trust and Obey, page 467, verses 1, 2, and 3.
So now it is my blessing to ask us each to remember God's many blessings in our life. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ fill your hearts in ways that challenge, in ways that transform, in ways that give new vision of God's kingdom. May the love of God surround and embrace you, keeping you safe in all things and sending you forth on mission. And as you go forth to create the good, may each word you speak, each embrace you offer, each, each handshake you extend be done in full communion with God's Holy Spirit. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And it is his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we close as we do each time we gather these powerful words. We are a people loved by God. May we live as a sign to the world of God's love. Now we're going to do something just a bit different. It's not that we're not going to have special music. We're going to close with Shalom, which is in your hymnal on page 666. Rather interesting numbers there. Uh, we'll close with Shalom, and uh, I invite everyone to sing. Okay. <laughs>